this is the encoder world. I've shown you some of this. Yeah. I'm not sure I've shown you all of it. No. This time, instead of theory, I wanted to look at some encoders that are actually more practical. Oh. So these are much closer to something someone would actually build if they were trying to make a fast bulk storage system. This is the one that took like 30 hours of math to make. <laughs> so we'll get to this one. Interestingly, they get increasingly faster and messier, which is kind of cool. Yeah, we'll start with this one because it's the easiest to understand, but out of these three, it's the slowest. Okay. It is by far faster than anything I've shown previously in the... <laughs> I have carrots in here. Okay. Press it. Minecart goes off. We get oh. the code. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, the way this works, it's kind of a reminder is I made a 7-bit encoder back there that mm -hmm. could handle 115 items. So to handle, you know, 900, 1,000 items, I just put, like, 8 of it <laughs> <laughs> one after the other. Okay. And they all feed into these same 7 bits here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, let's just say this one produces the same code for carrots as this one produces for apples the way that we can still tell apart whether an apple or a carrot was put into the machine is by these three bits down here. Okay. So the top seven are the seven bits produced by any one of the encoders. The bottom three just mark which of the uh, eight encoders here the code came from. Oh, I see. That makes sense. So it's kind of like the street address of <laughs> each one of these if they were a house. Yeah. This is the exact same machine, um, but... There's also a piston bolt on top, which means the minecart not only gets sent off very quickly, mm. but returns very quickly once it's finished the encoding process. Yeah, it travels faster than if it were just rolling. Okay. Uh, to get over a thousand items, I added a ninth sub encoder. So there we had like eight okay. houses mm -hmm. on the street. Here we have nine. nine. Uh, and nine requires four binary digits of address instead of three. Okay. So with three, you can only address eight houses. Uh, now you can actually address up to 16, so you could expand this without changing it. What is the 50% above? Um, because this thing produces 11 bits, uh -huh. There are, there's about 2,000 different 11-bit uh, codes, and we're only using 1,035 of them, or oh, about 50%. 50%. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this one... <laughs> is a little bit better uh, for two reasons. That. So the person who got me into encoding data nerd showed me two tricks that made this one a bit easier. Uh, this one I also resets its own code when I hit start. So let's start with, so we'll encode carrots again. Okay. Send it off. And there you go. You'll notice this one is different because the code the final code was actually changing while it was running yeah i did notice that so the reason that's going on is that now it's not one to one between the item filters and the uh top bit lines here so back over here each filter only activated one of the seven bit lines okay. on top and uh the connection between a filter and the bit lines is made by this observer here Data suggested something called bit grouping, which is where each one of the item filters no longer activates a single bit line, but a group of bits, hence okay. bit grouping. Right. So here, for instance, yeah, this filter activates, look, every bit line, because oh, wow. we have a solid line of observers here. Mm -hmm. The reason that's helpful is that now some filters, when they go off, can actually turn off the bits that previous filters in the encoding had turned on. Okay. So the filters can kind of like fight over bits and turn them off and on, um, which turns out to be useful because you can get more distinct codes with less filters, okay. which is great. So when the code is changing, that is part of its specific code, right? So if you send like a carrot through... Um, and this changes twice, mm -hmm. that means that's the carrot code, the twice changing whatever it is that it changes. Yes, so okay. that's planned out. That's not like it breaking or okay. anything. <laughs> Makes 1,009 codes, uh, 10 bits, and there's 1,024 total 10-bit codes. So we're using like 99% of the code space of all yeah. possible codes. The bit grouping 
lets us get away with actually way less item filters. So this has, I believe, 41 item filters. Mm -hmm. This has 63. <clears throat> Oh, okay. And this one produces pretty much the same amount of codes and with More. one less bit. The distance here means that the minecart takes two seconds less to travel through the machine because it takes about one second to travel 20 blocks. I see. That makes sense. Uh, secondly, instead of rolling the minecart up on the backside to the top, mm -hmm. we're popping it up with a slime block. Yeah. So minecart gets sent off. It's popped up <laughs> and it goes okay. right back so very fast um maybe like half a second to one second whereas over there it's one to three seconds i see with these bit groups you can see there's kind of a pattern here yeah um i chose them by hand back here it gets a bit more chaotic but i did a bunch of math to try to figure out a strategic way to choose bit groups and that's that's what i was staying up until <laughs> 3 a.m doing <laughs> <laughs> And this, these are the bit groups I found. Huh. So it looks super messy, chaotic, but this was like produced algorithmically by a Python program. Okay. When an item goes through, it can only activate one, two, or three of the filters. If you activate four or more, the amount of different items you can encode starts dropping quickly. So to get as many different items as possible that the machine can handle, you limit yourself to one, two, or three item filters. And so this bit group has the really weird property that you can make every 10-bit code either from one of these, from combining two of them, or from combining three of them. And then if you were to say combine like these two here, this bit line here, so the fifth one from the left, would get activated twice, <laughs> once by the first bit group and again by the second and in net total it would cancel out so first one turns it on second yeah. one turns it off okay so i can actually fly over here activate the second bit group so we see that one moves down and now here if i activate the next one that one will move back up as if it had never moved oh okay and then uh once they're all here there's a little circuit here that kind of converts the 10 digit binary code into Morse code. So oh. this this repeater here uh, flickers in a really specific way that communicates which 10 bit code was produced. Okay. It's called serialization. One last problem is that pistons can only push 12 blocks at a time or pull 12 blocks at a time. And so like, you know, this bit group here, it's 10 sticky blocks and four observers. Oh. So it's not pushable. Yeah. The way I got around this was by taking these bit groups yeah. and folding one over onto the bottom. So the left five bit lines here are on top. And then I folded the rest of the observers over onto the bottom. And that's what the rightmost five bit lines are here. So there's 42 item filters. Here's the 42 bit groups. Okay. And then down here, I actually oh, print God. out all 1,024 10-bit codes, and then which bit groups combine to make it. Oh. If an item's 10-bit code was eight ones, a zero and a one, mm -hmm. you would encode that item by putting it in the second, 28th, and 27th item filters. I see. And then those three, when they fire, cancel out in just the right way to make that uh, single code on the left there. Okay. Actually looks like here, interestingly, there's no cancellation. Okay. These three don't share any bits. How can you tell that... Oh, whether or not yeah. cancellation is going yeah. on? Uh, so like right here, we have some cancellation. Okay. And I, you can tell that because <laughs> if these two bit groups, groups mm. of bits, have any bit in common, they cancel. So they both... Oh. They have the first bit right. in common, so that'll okay. cancel. Um, it looks like fourth to last bit they also have in common, so okay. that'll cancel. And that's 34 and 35. I wonder if we can actually test that out. Okay, so let's highlight this. And do is I don't think I've actually set this up. I haven't done a test with this yet, so uh, <laughs> I just had to scrap like 
10 minutes of footage because <laughs> I was trying to demonstrate uh, using a particular code on here um, with carrots. So I was setting up carrots inside of this machine to match one of the codes and it didn't work. So <laughs> uh, I think though this thing is cool enough that I'll give it its own video with explaining everything when it's done in more depth. So for now, I'll just explain what still needs to be fixed on this thing. Oh, okay. One of the problems it has that can demonstrate with this machine over here. So instead of carrots, we're going to code apples. And apples I set up so that the item filters that check for apples are right next to each other. Hmm. A slight problem with that is that these bit lines that detect when a filter goes off can only take input after a certain amount of delay since the previous input. What that means is if two filters activate the same bit line right after each other, that bit line will not go off twice and cancel. It will go off once. Oh. So what's going to happen here is I think it's the middle. Yeah, so the middle lamp down here. Oh, did I still have the game frozen? Yeah. No. The middle lamp down here should be off because oh. two filters activated it. Oh, but because oh. they were right next to it, they didn't cancel out and it's still on. So part of the challenge with this machine is there's so many consecutive filters that activate the same bit line. Anywhere you see two observers touching sideways, that's a possible error like the one you just saw. And so the challenge is to try to order these things so that there's as little of this doubling up as possible. The reason, though, that I'm pushing so hard to make these smaller and faster is that they're really close to the theoretical limit. So if we add up how many game ticks these things take to run, it takes four game ticks for a minecart to be dispensed, another five for it to pick up the prefill items and the item to be encoded, so that brings us up to nine, plus 42 to go underneath everything, brings us up to 51. I think it's f the bump up here is something like 14 game ticks when I calculated it, uh, so that brings us up to 65, then another 42 to head back is 100... 107, and I think five more to be destroyed. So 112 game ticks before we can send off the next minecart. Uh, the point is, though, most of those numbers that I just added up can't be made smaller. <laughs> so that 42 for, you know, going underneath and coming back over, the lowest it can be and still get all 10 bit codes is 41. So that can't be made much smaller, and that's why finding this setup was so hard, because it's pushing so close to the fundamental limit. You can shave a few ticks off by dispensing the next minecart while the top one is still returning, like maybe when it's right here. But oddly, the biggest room for time savings now is nothing to do with the encoding part, it's the bumping up. The oh. biggest room for improvement on this encoder is no longer the actual encoding. It's just getting the minecart from the bottom up to, to the, the top. top at the end here. Huh. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, if you were to do that instantly, which is possible, you can actually move minecarts like 10 blocks in a single game tick. It's just, by the way, that's a recent thing that's been figured out. So this is a good application for the new technology of single tick long distance entity movement. If you were to get all that shaved down, this thing would, I think, take four and a half seconds to encode each item. Like, it would produce its code in two seconds or so, but it would take another two or so to reset. So you could put a new item in every four and a half seconds. Wow. That's the limit. That's the fastest theoretical possible. <laughs> this one you can put a new item in every five and a half seconds. Okay, so it's got like a second or so. Yeah, beneath the theoretical fastest. Whereas uh, this one over here takes 10 seconds, so it's much more user-friendly, but it's also slower, less code density. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching.